Well, good, good morning, everybody. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really, um, really happy to see all of you here and we're happy to be presenting uh, our wellness series in collaboration with the United Way and, uh, and so many other community partners. You know, um, we often talk about it um, with friends, maybe sometimes family. Um, we sometimes joke about it with colleagues, the emotional toll that the last year and a half has taken on all of us. And, um, and the reality is, is that while um, that is a coping mechanism, right, for us to sort of make light of the situation, um, the situation is actually pretty dire. And, uh, and people, um, everyone, myself included, have, uh, have found the last year and a half to be extremely taxing and have struggled um, to figure out how to, which end is up some days, um, how to stay motivated, how to take care of ourselves, um, how to ask for help. And so we're thrilled to be in a position uh, to deliver some programming uh, to all of you um, that brings the conversation around mental health out of the shadows, um, elevates it to the place that it should be, which is just another, um, it's another thing that we all deal with in our personal lives and in our work lives that we have to find ways to, to manage, um, just like everything else. And there's no, um, there's no stigma associated with it. There shouldn't be. Um, we all have our internal struggles and demons and challenges that we fight uh, and being able to find ways to, um, to talk about it openly, to find people that we can share with and that we can learn from is a part of our collective journey here on this earth. So um, I'm thrilled that you all are here. I'm excited to be running this uh, programming series uh, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to my friend and colleague, Nan Eaton at the United Way uh, for her leadership and helping to make this happen. Uh, a large part of this was her idea um, and, and her convening. And so I'd like to stop here and, and turn the program over to Nan. Thank you, Rob. And what, uh, what a thrill it is for us to be with so many friends and colleagues today. I began my career in mental health, and so ever since I've recognized the importance of mental wellness as a piece of overall health and the fact that we as a society struggle to talk about this. So we are honored to partner with Center State Contact Community Services, St. Joe's and Upstate to begin this series of Wellness Wednesdays so we can all understand what mental health means and what it's all about in terms of how we, how we uh, think about our own health, how we support the health of people around us. And we will be offering on October 20th, another session that will be uh, focused on folks who are in supervisory roles and how you support um, those who report to you and, and the kinds of resources we have in this community, because there are many, and we wanna make sure everybody knows that they are there and how to access them. So this is, today's the beginning and we're glad you've chosen to join us uh, for this session. I am delighted to uh, introduce the moderator who will uh, host us today for the rest of the time, Lisa Dunn Alford, who is the Executive Director of ACR Health. Many of you may know Lisa from her time in nonprofits, county government, and her local, regional, and statewide uh, work. Now she is leading ACR Health, one of our most important organizations. Lisa has a bachelor's degree from Hampton University, a master's degree from Ohio State University, and executive certificates from SU, UCLA, and Georgetown. So Lisa, we're grateful to you for being willing to share your time, and I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nan. Uh, I really appreciate that. And as you said, I, uh, we know mental health is so important to not only those of us personally, but in the uh, workplace and the impact it can have on our employees and those that they in turn serve. Um, today, I'd like to first start out by welcoming Nicole Hotchkiss, who is the Clinical Coordinator for Contact Community Services. Nicole is going to share with us some initial information as we start our discussion. Nicole is the Clinical Coordinator for Contact Community Services. She was born and raised in Houston, Texas. 
In 2013, she received her master's in clinical mental health counseling from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. In 2016, she moved to Syracuse for a life-changing opportunity and started a new chapter with family counseling services. In 2019, she joined Contact as a crisis line worker. She has 10 years of experience with crisis intervention, disaster relief, chemical dependency, working with college athletes and incarcerated women. She's a proud mom of a four-year-old four twins and a six-month-old. She loves traveling, hiking, photography, and is a huge advocate of nature therapy. Uh, now I'll turn it over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Lisa. It's so great to be here, guys. Um, and so really, in some ways, we are in the early stages of managing mental health or understanding what mental health is. And so I think the first place is to really have a conversation to break down those barriers. Um, so thank you for today. Thank you for letting me speak with you today. Spend a little time talking about addressing mental health in the workplace. And so what is mental health? Well, mental health is a state of well-being. It influences how we think, how we feel, how we interpret events. It affects our capacity to learn, to communicate and form relationships and manage those relationships. And it also influences our ability to cope with stress, change and transition and big life events such as having a baby, starting a family, um, grieving the loss of a loved one. <clears throat> and so in talking about mental health, what does mental illness look like? And really when I talk about mental illness, um, I want to say that in our department at work, you know, we, we frame it as mental health problems. Um, we try to use mental health problems instead of mental illness to help break down that stigma. And so it's really important to be mindful of the language that you use when approaching this, since it is still a very um, delicate subject for so many, especially in the workplace. Mental illness or mental health problems, going back to that, it can be summed up as, you know, health conditions involving changes in emotion, thinking, feeling, and that is often associated with distress. And so going to this slide, what does it look like? Who struggles? To give you a little perspective, one in five Americans struggle with mental health problems and 10 million have lived with some serious mental health problem. One in 20 adults experience suicidal ideations or suicidal thoughts at any given two week period. So really, you know, looking at this slide, there's this perception of what mental health looks like. And so who does it look like? I'll ask that again. You know, it looks like you, it looks like me, it looks like our family members who we know and we love. It looks like the grocery store, Joe, um, that serves in the deli. It looks like Susie that works at Beacon Skiff, which I highly recommend that place if you haven't already been this time of year. Um, but yeah, it looks like people that we share a cubicle with. It looks like people we know, and it looks like people we love. And so looking at current challenges, you know, we can't really talk about current challenges without shining a light on the global pandemic. We all have experienced this event, but we all have different versions of it. And overnight, our work lives, our family lives, our life dynamic, it all shifted. And so we're all faced with these different stressors and how we cope with it. And some cope with it better than others. Um, we know the pandemic brought on increased levels of fear, anxiety, and depression. We know that the employee assistance program utilization increased rate, reported rates as high as, um, increased rates as high as 3,000%. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, we know that the pandemic brought on increased levels of fear and anxiety, but here, here is the data that supports that. And so moving on to this cartoon, you know, we, um, we may well be looking at the straw that broke the camel's back. So with mental health problems, it's not going to be as big and obvious as the straw in this cartoon, but it's a visual, the straw in this, in this cartoon, it's a visual representation of what a trigger could look like. And if you have enough straws, which the list right here, um, those can represent straws as well or triggers. If you have enough straws and triggers, then you might find it more difficult to maintain stability in managing your mental wellness. And so here's a list that we can run through and I won't run through all of them, but um, so feeling lack of control, isolation, loneliness, feeling disconnected. 
um, risk to self or loved ones. Um, an example of this during the pandemic would be someone working in a gas station, working minimum wage and, you know, having to decide whether to go to work or staying at home, you know, because their daughter or son is, you know, out of school and then they're taking care of their father, their sick father, who's vulnerable to, to the, to this COVID-19. And so really that additional stress, you could see that contributing to the numbers, um, increased workload, feeling behind at work. There's nothing worse than feeling, you know, like you're sinking and you can't get ever, you can't get ahead. Um, so additional stress in the workplace, high stakes job when there's everything on the line, um, and then persistent stress. If you have tiny roadblocks, you know, and stressors that pop up in your life and you don't deal with them in a healthy way, it's just going to build and build and build, um, until you feel this lack of control. And so I always tell people it's important to say you're on the highway, picture it like this, say you're on a highway, you know, you have to take care of your car to maintain it. You have to take care of yourself. Um, if there's a stressor in your life, get off at the, the next exit, take a second, deal with the stressor, deal with the roadblock, and then get back on the highway that we call life. Um, and so what we're seeing in this next slide is, is, so this graph, this comes from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And so surveys that were conducted during the pandemic found that many workers um, are experiencing burnout. Um, and so, you know, really going back to the grocery store, the gas station clerk that I mentioned earlier, our whole definition or idea of essential worker changed and shifted in March of 2020, right? And so we were seeing doctors, nurses, law enforcement, uh, people on the front lines that we would think of as essential workers. But really overnight, we were starting to clump the grocery store workers, the gas station workers also in this amongst other different types of jobs. But, you know, these are minimum wage jobs. And then so if you take that in addition to the stress of all the other limitations with, you know, daycare, childcare, you know, you can see that those numbers would, would be included in all this. And so I want to take a look at this graph. So the data was collected in June of 2020. The information was all self-reported. And you can see that essential workers, 42% reported symptoms of anxiety and depressive disorder. 25% <clears throat> were dealing with these in destructive ways, such as coping and masking their issues with the use of, of substance use. And then what's alarming is essential workers compared to non-essential workers, you know, they were reporting higher levels of suicidal thoughts and seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. And so we know once again that the pandemic created anxiety and depression and, and fear, but here are the numbers to back it up and more reason to talk about this more openly. <clears throat> and so looking at this generational shift, some say that we're, we have this generational shift of, of perception and this is a hopeful message. Here's a hopeful message that we're moving in a positive direction. And I'm just gonna go ahead and read this from the Harvard Business Review. Half of millennials and 75% of Gen Zers had left roles in the past for mental health reasons, both voluntarily and involuntarily, compared with 34% of respondents overall, a finding that speaks to a generational shift in awareness. So what this says is that people more, are more aware of mental health and people are taking action. <clears throat> And, you know, as it was mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, here is our opportunity for mental health to come out of the shadows, for us to have these hard conversations. Now, more than, now is a time more than ever to openly discuss and share mental health concerns in the workplace, at home, with our family circle, with our friend circle. You have here the next generation leading the way. And I will say, you know, whenever I was thinking of this topic for this presentation, you know, I work for contact community services. We operate different lines of service, different hotlines, 211, Crisis Connect, the suicide prevention line. And so when we, I was thinking about people that call in that talk about mental health and talk about job related stress. And so I know from experience that it really is a real fear for people to, to disclose that they have a mental health problem in a workplace setting for fear of getting overlooked, 
um, with different projects or possibly being passed up for a promotion. Um, so I do know that that's a really, um, that's a real fear. And so it's, it's nice that we have these hopeful messages where people are actually leaving if leaving roles, if they feel that, you know, their mental health is being jeopardized or compromised. Um, that's moving in a different direction. So, so where do we go from here and what should we do? So we should talk about it. It's as simple as that. Talking about it reduces mental health or talking about mental health reduces stigma. And so this is what we promote on the crisis lines, on the hotlines. We alleviate stigma by talking about it. We make it okay. And I will say, you know, a lot of times people don't know what to say and they just want to jump to a solution and really you're doing your friend or your coworker or your family member a disservice by skipping over the process of talking about it. And so there's healing and talking. <clears throat> and I will say working with, you know, all different types of populations, incarcerated women, people in hospice, disaster relief, you know, everybody, there is a common denominator. Everybody has a story to share and everybody wants to be heard. I think we all just wanna be heard, right? And so on this slide right here, what's next? The ears have put together are shaped like a heart when you put them together. Have you ever thought of this guys? Um, so just, if, you, if you're sitting in your, if you're sitting and watching this, you put your hands up and put your thumbs out and put your fin first fingers make a C. I don't know if I'm explaining this right. <laughs> um, if you cup it over your ear, it's kind of shaped like a C and you extend it out and it makes a heart. So this is a sweet little way of reminding yourself that ears are the extension of a heart. And it's really true. If you know how to listen, then you know how to love and support other people. You know, there's such power in listening. There's such power in active listening. There's such power in empathy and creating a safe space, a non-judgmental space. <clears throat> and so how do we, <clears throat> how do we manage mental health or mental wellness? Here are some strategies. Being mentally strong is a huge component of well-being and stress reduction. And so there's a number of, of practical ways. I'll just name a few. Um, definitely, I would say piece of advice is not wasting your time on things that are out, that are out of your control. Um, practice gratitude and mindfulness, move your body, express yourself. When someone's asking how you're doing, um, try to move away from the auto reply. I'm fine. How many times have you, have you said that to, to people? I'm fine. I'm fine. Keep on moving. Um, allow yourself to feel sad. So when you're feeling sad, feel sad. Um, there's a lot of value in keeping a routine, getting out of bed, taking a shower, grabbing some coffee. If that's what you do or tea. Um, it's a lot easier to know when something is out of line, when you have a routine. And it's just, it's, it's a positive way of moving forward to have a routine. As far as sleep goes, you know, I'm still working on this myself. I have, as Lisa mentioned, uh, two four-year-olds and a six-month-old. So I'm, I'm still working on this one. Um, eating healthy, meal prepping, planning your meals in advance, Avoiding things that numb the pain, such as alcohol. Anytime you mask something or numb something, it's just putting a Band-Aid on something and eventually it'll either get worse or manifest itself in other ways. And go to counseling if it feels right for you. You know, in my time and my experience working um, as a family counselor, I would have people that had already had experiences with other counselors and not necessarily good experiences. And so they were already shut off. And I would say to you, give, give another try. And sometimes it takes a few different counselors until you find the right fit for you, okay? And so what do we strive for? We strive for balance. We strive to focus on building resilience and we utilize our support systems at home and work. And mental health, you know, it can be complex. It affects all aspects of our life. The stigma of mental health can no longer be ignored. It has our attention. And really this is just a starting point to continue that conversation. And yeah, think positive, breathe mindfully. And that it concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Nicole. Those are great thoughts to uh, have us um, really get started and 
for the setting the stage for the rest of our presentation today. I'd now like to introduce the panelists that will be sharing with us today. First, I'd like to introduce Angel Gonzalez. He's a certified peer specialist with St. Joseph's Health. Angel has been working in the mental health field for 12 years. He helps clients and patients by utilizing personal lived experiences as a certified peer specialist. Angel has over 25 years of personal recovery from depression and anxiety and substance use. Angel has been certified for six years and just recently passed his exam for the CRPA certification or the Certified Recovery Peer Advocate. At St. Joseph Joseph's Health, Angel works with patients who struggle with suicidal ideations, depression, anxiety, as well as substance use disorders. In addition to his work at St. Joseph's Health, Angel also works for another local agency where he meets with clients at their place of residence and helps them overcome their struggles. Welcome, Angel. Next, I introduce Dr. Thomas Schwartz with SUNY Upstate Medical University. Dr. Schwartz is currently a professor and chair of psychiatry at SUNY Upstate Medical University, where he is active on many teaching, administrative, and academic-oriented committees at SUNY. He also provides direct resident supervision, lectures in several courses with resident, medical physician assistant, and nurse practitioner students. He directs and organizes continuing medical education events for the psychiatry department. Dr. Schwartz received his medical degree from and completed his residency in adult psychiatry at the State University of New York, Upstate Medical University in Syracuse. Welcome, Dr. Schwartz. And lastly, we have Chow Wee, who is a behavioral health outpatient services provider at St. Joseph's Health. Chow is a New York State licensed clinical social worker. Chow received her bachelor's in science degree from Syracuse University and her master's of social work from New York University. For the past 13 years, she has been working as a clinical social worker at St. Joseph's Children and Youth Behavioral Outpatient Clinic. Chow provides individual, family, and group therapy to children and adolescents between the ages of four to 18 years old and their family members. Chow is also responsible for triaging potential new patients for our service. Welcome panelists. I would just like to start out by, you know, facilitating some discussion with our panelists and I'll start out with you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, should persons talk with their primary care physicians about how they are feeling? You know, I, I think so. Um, and, and again, I know everybody doesn't have a, a primary care physician, um, but they're probably the most plentiful. And whether it's uh, you're a youngster and it's a pediatrician, a family practice doctor, your internist, if you've gone in, you've seen them for you know, well child checks, annual physicals, sinus infections, you may already have a, a pretty good rapport with, with that person. So I, I think it's a great place to start. I mean, certainly talk to uh, family, colleagues, um, clergy members, there's lots of people you can talk to. But yeah, it, it was, as far as the medical profession is gone, if you already have a relationship with somebody like that, it, it's a great place to start a conversation about how you're doing. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Chow, I'd like to ask you, what are some of the common mental health symptoms and struggles that you see as a clinic therapist and are seeing that are affecting the general workforce? Anxiety is definitely one of them, for sure. Um, a survey from the US Census Bureau in December showed that 42% of US adults reported symptoms of anxiety or depression compared to just 11% in 2019. So kind of going back to what Nicole was saying when she was introducing mental health, we cannot really talk about what's happening in the field of mental health without talking about the pandemic. And clearly, if we are comparing data, um, we're seeing a significant increase in anxiety buildup um, and depression due to, as Nicole had previously mentioned, um, isolation, confusion, um, fear, right? And also um, just in general, Sadness and grief, um, you know, as humans, we are designed to socialize and interact with others and we haven't had the opportunity to do so. Um, at least not a lot of us feel comfortable doing so at least. Um, 
And also fear of change can increase anxiety as well. Um, whether you are working from home or working in um, on site, that you never know really what's happening and just the uncertainty and the inability to really know what's gonna happen is creating a lot of change because we feel so out of control. Um, you know, anxiety a lot of times is caused by feeling out of control um, and we definitely don't really have a good control on the current situation. So um, naturally anxiety goes up. Um, and just, um, People are also angry and upset. And sometimes um, it's whether it's feeling like the workplace, um, their employers are not doing enough to protect them. Or of course, um, the more controversial topics of what's going on right now with some of the mandates in the healthcare system. So, you know, I mean, it's really a lot of everything, but it's mostly just anxiety, depression, um, anger, um, and also just PTSD, we're collectively going through trauma as a nation, as a, as a society, as a community. And that's really what we're seeing a lot of. Thank you. Those are very, very uh, broad symptoms and, and so true. Um, Angel, um, can you share with us what exactly is a peer specialist for those of us, uh, those in the audience that may not know? Okay, sorry, I had to unmute myself for a second. Um, peer specialist, um, well, someone who has lived experience, who has been trained uh, to working with people who are struggling from mental health issues, uh, substance use issues, um, some trauma, um, depression, anxiety, as myself. Um, I used to think that uh, someone who is currently working through their issues uh, wouldn't qualify as a, peer, as a peer specialist. That is to be known untrue. Um, a peer specialist can be working through their own uh, personal issues um, and be certified to help somebody else uh, work through theirs as well. Okay, great. And I think that, as you said, that lived experience is so important. That's something that um, many times makes it easier for people to connect with you. So that's vitally important. Um, Dr. Schwartz, um, People always want to know, will they have to take medications if they see a therapist, a psychiatrist, or a primary care physician? Um, maybe, maybe a good place for me uh, to start answering that question is to, to back up a little bit. And so let's say if you do have depression, anxiety, stress, anger, um, things that are bothering you at home at the workplace, um, you know, what are your treatment options? And we mentioned, you know, certainly a few of them. Um, you know, to answer you know, my question, it, it really depends who you see. Um, if you see a counselor or a therapist in New York State, they do not prescribe medicines. So you know, again, if you went to see a, a psychologist, uh, mental health social worker, um, mental health uh, counselor, um, American family counselor, there's a lot of people with counseling degrees that do excellent psychotherapy. If you go see them, chances are you would go for a weekly psychotherapy sessions. Um, and there probably would not be medications involved with that provider. If you go to your uh, primary care physician, uh, your family doctor, um, a psychiatrist can prescribe, a physician's assistant can prescribe, as can a nurse practitioner, all of which are involved in the mental health field. So really depending who you go see, they have different skill sets. Um, some do psychotherapy, some prescribe medicines and, and some can actually do both. So I, I do think it, it really depends probably who you reach out to first. And again, what if you go see um, your family practice doctor and they say, I'd like you to take an antidepressant. You can say no, right? They should also tell you psychotherapy works well and maybe they can help you get a referral. So you were never made to take a medicine. Um, I've also met people that don't want to talk to somebody every week and they'll refuse therapy, but choose a medicine. And so I always like to, to meet the patient where they're at. Um, almost every condition has two, three different ways to, to treat it and to get people to do better and feel better. Uh, but typically, yeah, counseling uh, or medicines or both, um, you have choices, but you got to start seeing somebody and start asking those questions and they should give you a variety of treatment options. Okay, 
Thank you. That's so important for people to realize they do have options and that they should interview and make sure they find someone that's a good fit for them. So those are important things to consider. Um, uh, Chow, uh, many in the workforce are, we know are parents of younger uh, children, uh, as Nicole was mentioning, adolescents or many times even caregivers to their own parents or other persons in their families that may need assistance. How has the mental health of caregivers been affected due to the COVID pandemic? I had also muted myself, I'm sorry. Um, so women are typically the caretaker, caregiver role. Um, and women are dropping out of the workforce at an unprecedented rate due to this pandemic um, because there's the increasing burden of parenting and running a household during the pandemic um, with the possibility of school closing and children having to quarantine due to exposures at school, um, whether you're a woman or a man, any caregiver, right, are forced to have to make the difficult choice between staying at home with the children or dropping out of work, especially if you don't have an alternate, um, alternative way of providing childcare without having to give up your job. Um, and without the ability to work, obviously, due to the above mentioned reasons, um, financial stress increases and you're losing an income in the household. Um, so, and then also it's like this chain, vicious chain reaction, this vicious cycle, because then there's guilt. Um, guilt also increases whether it is the choice to stay at home with your children and be become a full-time caregiver or to stay employed because there's guilt from not being able to contribute financially to the household. And there's guilt from having to send a child to school or daycare due to choosing to work and possibly increasing the risk of exposing them to sickness and COVID. Um, so it's, it's, you know, stress, obviously, um, a lot of, um, as Nicole had mentioned during her introduction, a lot of workers are burned out. Um, and that also can affect their ability to take care of other people um, in their own families, whether they are parents um, or children. And some people are choosing to self-medicate, right? So alcohol consumption has significantly increased during the pandemic. And that can also um, impair your ability as a caretaker. So, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's, just this, this vicious cycle of not really having answers and not really having, um, feeling like you don't have, um, you, you're not making the right choice or feeling like you're never able to make the right choice. Thank you. Those are great points to consider, especially as you said, um, as many women are in the workforce and that uh, and anyone who's managing work and then also those caregiving responsibilities, definitely a lot to carry. Um, Angel, what would you say is the best way to approach someone you think is struggling at home in the community or in the workplace? Um, I agree with Nicole, what she said earlier about listening. Um, to me, listening is one of the best ways to um, um, talk to an individual. Uh, you want to get the individual to talk to you. And if you're interrupting the individual every time they try to try to explain themselves, um, they're gonna be struggling just as much as you're gonna be struggling. Uh, if you're thinking about giving the answer before they stop talking, again, that's not, that's not uh, thorough listening. Um, I uh, run into that a lot here at uh, CPEP, uh, whether a patient be telling me, uh, well, I just talked to the nurse, I talked to the doctor, they're not listening to me. And it's, it's kind of hard to put them there because most doctors, most nurses um, don't have that lived experience, right, um, per se. Some do, some don't. Uh, the majority of them don't. Um, so it's hard for, for them to truly listen to what a patient is trying to get across. Um, and that in, in, uh, turns out to be, for the patient, it turns out to be very frustrating because they think that they're explaining themselves well enough for them to understand, for the doctor or the nurse to understand, uh, unfortunately they're not, right? So unless you have lived what the person is talking about uh, and you're listening for that cue um, and you come back to the person and say, you know what? I hear what you're saying. 
I relate to what you're saying and let them know that you also had struggles. This gets not only the, the um, uh, trust of the individual to, to continue to talk with you, but the person knows this is gonna feel more relaxed to be able to have that conversation with you. That's where you built that relationship uh, to better understand where the person is coming from. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Dr. Schwartz, one of the things that we've seen a huge increase in is the use of telemental health. People, some people may have heard that term. It's certainly given the uh, ability for people maybe to have the availability or opportunity to uh, find mental health professionals with their lived experience or their cultural background. So tell us exactly what is telemental health? Yeah, it certainly is uh, one of those positive things maybe that comes from our, our COVID experience. Um, so traditionally, you want to go see um, your doctor, your therapist, uh, at least where I am, you have to travel downtown, pay for parking, navigate one-way streets, and maybe I have to commute for a half an hour, see me for an hour, commute, and it, it's tough. And some people don't have transportation. Some people don't have money for parking. Some people hate driving into the city. And what we've learned is we can meet people just like this. We're using Zoom here today, um, but you can use Zoom, WebEx, Doxy, um, you know, there's Skype and FaceTime. They're, they're not as secure um, from an encryption point of view, but we can provide care just like we're meeting today. Uh, we have the ability to see each other, talk to each other, and what we've noticed, and I suspect this is true for other area mental health providers, um, we saw 15% more people during COVID. And some of that's because people were stressed out and, and having trouble. But the reality is when people carry their smartphone with them, they can do a visit anytime, anywhere. I've had patients who forgot their appointment with me who were in the middle of Wegmans and went out to their car and had their appointment. So one reason our business went up is more people showed up. Um, so we're able to provide more care uh, because we have gave patients better access, easier access. Um, so I do think it, it, it's, it's also, uh, it's an interesting and a great way to provide a higher quantity of care and it does make it easier for people. So I do think we're able to reach out and see and treat more people. It comes with some negatives. Um, I think psychotherapy sometimes doesn't work through well through a TV screen. It doesn't work well with my, my geriatric patients. It works great with my college students. Um, so I do think you have to, um, you know, certainly again, meet the patient where they're at. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uses a lot of kind of homework and exchanging ideas and I can't do that remotely. Uh, so there's some places it works great, some places it, it doesn't work well at all. And some people really you need to be in a room with them. So it's not the, the answer for everything. But telemental health, um, you know, I think has been an exciting addition. The insurance companies are paying for it now. They didn't really pay much for it before COVID. So we're all learning, uh, clinicians, the insurance industries, uh, patients. Um, I do think the other window it gives me as a, a provider is I actually see more in the people's lives. So if they're in their office here behind me, I, I get to know them in my setting, but I haven't seen them in their car or I haven't seen them at their house. Uh, I haven't met their cat, their dog, their, their, their kids, their, you know. And sometimes we see tough things, domestic violence. Sometimes we see this in real time, which I never would have seen in my office. Um, so I, I do think it's become a, a very good um, a clinical tool. Uh, I suspect we should have a mixture of televideo and in-person care going forward. Um, so that's what it's like. You're seeing your doctor, uh, your therapist, your counselor, your, your, your uh, peer support person uh, through the video screen, and you're, you're getting legitimate medical care that way. Okay. It's certainly important to have another option in the uh, behavioral health toolbox. So, uh, but it's important to hear those, um, some of the uh, benefits as well as some of the challenges with that. But it certainly gives us another, um, as I said, tool in our toolbox. Um, Chow, today we know that in our workforce, it's certainly multi-generational. Uh, so we know it's important to recognize how the generations may see mental health differently. Uh, what are some of the mental health, uh, the generational differences that you uh, have seen or are aware of? Um, 
I keep referencing back to Nicole. She did such a great presentation. Um, she had, she also already touched up on that a little bit. Um, so we are definitely seeing a change and a shift in how we recognize mental health between the different generations. Um, I think with the baby boomers or even like the generate the Gen X generations, um, mental health was, mental health disorders were, are just perceived um, so differently back then how, when we were raised and when they were raised and their own misconceptions on mental health, right? These gen generations of individuals are more likely to be in a position of power at work. Um, therefore, how is their view on mental health disorders hindering the work environment and discouraging perhaps the gen Y workers from wanting to work in such an environment? Um, because the, the younger generations, the college students, the ones that are in their 20s and early 30s, um, they have, a much more accepting view on mental health um, as they are raised in a time when mental health is being more normalized and they often see it as part of self-care um, and not so much that, oh, I'm, I, I have a mental disease or I have a mental illness, um, which is a lot of times what, how that's being labeled um, in the older generation, right? That they're, that they worry about um, being labeled as mental or mad or or crazy, um, and then how it's going to interfere with their social status and even employment opportunities. But the younger generations are definitely not seeing it that way anymore. Um, they see they they feel the need to take mental health days. They feel the need to take care of their body, not just physically but also mentally and emotionally. And that's definitely a change and a shift um, in a positive direction for sure. Um, that perhaps the older generation, um, older generations didn't really focus on as much. So, you know, I think acknowledging and noticing these differences is important because um, we want to be able to support this kind of work environment. We want to be able to, to support um, the differences and also not to just shame the older generations into thinking that you're wrong and you know, they were, they were just brought up in a much different time. Um, they were not educated. They were not exposed to the kind of information that we have today. Um, 20, 30 years ago, we would never have a panel like this, right? To talk about mental, mental disorders and mental illness. Um, and I think just broadening the education, being like exposing them and validating their own concerns, their own stigmas, their own experiences, and also normalizing like Nicole said, mental health doesn't look like the people that you see on the cover of the New York Post where they're like, you know, waving a knife and saying psycho, you know, mental health looks like your mom, your dad, your children, your aunt, your neighbor, right? Um, your friends, your teachers, they, we are all suffering and it's really time to look at that um, you know, on a broader, from a broader perspective and not just kind of and to use that as a as an opportunity to destigmatize de um, mental health. Okay, thank you. And Angel, um, what would be your message to the fellow community members who have actually wanted to reach out for behavioral health help, but haven't yet due to that fear or stigma? What would you be your message to them? Well, I would um, first um, ask them to like educate themselves about the mental health um, concerns, um, including substance abuse. Um, I would inform them that we have to take away the labels um, because a lot of people uh, that I've talked to anyways, um, they come in here and they, they're telling me that they're, they're suicidal because they're depressed um, or they have anxiety and they can't cope with it. They can't deal with it. Um, so their way of uh, dealing with it is by using drugs or alcohol. Um, and I let them know that I'm not here when I see them walking in through the door, I don't see depression. I don't see anxiety. I see a person seeking help. And, and as long as we can stay in that floor of things, um, it's, you know, taking away, removing the labels, removing that fear of, oh, if I see this doctor, he's going to give me some medication. I don't want to take medication. Like, well, okay. So again, that goes out of lived experience um, that I've had in my past, you know, that uh, comes to play in this because I also didn't want to take medication when I first started my recovery some 25 and a half years ago. Um, however, 
I knew that with medication and with uh, therapy and group therapy and counseling that I can succeed and uh, overcome all these uh, fears that I was having you know, and all this uh, and removing my own stigmas. Um, so by talking to them like that, um, I believe that at least that opens up their minds to maybe let's try this, um, you know, and, and we'll have a conversation on that and we'll start getting treatment. Some people I run into hit, um, they have that fear of staying, uh, getting into medication. I'll say, okay, so let's try the holistic approach if that's what you're looking for, you know? Again, that goes back to me as a peer, meeting the person wherever they're at, um, not where I think they should be at or where anybody else thinks they should be at. Great, great point. Um, one of the things that we do know that sometimes it is difficult to get an appointment with uh, a behavioral health provider. Uh, what do what would you suggest or recommend to someone? Uh, what would you recommend that they do if they are unable to get an appointment with a behavioral health provider for say three months or so and they're struggling? Um, I'll start out with Dr. Schwartz. Uh, and what are your thoughts? What would you suggest? Yeah, and it, it is, let's recognize it, it is tough. There is um, a shortage of mental health providers um, across every age group. And um, one thing, and it's hard to hear, especially when you're suffering, the best advice I think is call everybody. So talk to your insurance company, get a list of uh, mental health providers. You might get a list of 30 or 40. You may need to make a phone call and asked to get on wait lists and cancellation lists. So there's, it's tough, but there's a mathematical approach to just asking a lot of people and you may get a cancellation and, and get in sooner. So I, I do think, uh, unfortunately, there is an element of uh, struggling and calling and, and getting on, on, on wait lists. Uh, again, primary care physicians are also hard to find now. And again, maybe you do start by talking to your primary care physician. Um, while you're waiting, I think we, we've all heard communication is important. So if you have a good relationship with, with your boss, with colleagues at work, uh, friends, family, clergy members, um, you know, the key is to, to reach out and start asking. And, and sometimes what I've noticed, while well, people are waiting two, three months to be seen, they actually start to do better because they increase their support network, their support system, and uh, sometimes they don't need to come in. Other times their depression is 50% less by the time they get to see a provider. Uh, so I do think one way we've all heard is, you know, certainly reach out, ask questions of people who you think are suffering at home, at the workplace. Even that to me is a treatment and helps while you're waiting to, to get in. Mm -hmm. So it is tough. You, you just have to call and ask and get on wait lists and, and things of that nature. It's crummy, but, but we have a shortage of people that are in these roles. Okay, thank you. And we know there's certainly been the increased use of technology. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, you mentioned about telehealth uh, mm -hmm. and how that's being used. Uh, I know I've also heard about phone apps. Uh, are there any particular phone apps that any of you would recommend? And I will uh, say there, there is um, information on the uh, resource sheet uh, that will be going out, but are there any particular phone apps any of you would recommend? Um, there are definitely a lot of, um therapy apps now available to people. So like Dr. Schwartz says, um, we're seeing the same issues here at St. Joe's uh, outpatient where the wait is long. Um, my, my suggestion to people to kind of piggyback on what Dr. Schwartz was saying is don't give up. It's discouraging to have to call and don't hear back. And it's discouraging to feel like um, you are not getting anywhere. And I've definitely heard plenty of parents call and tell me, um, I feel like no one wants to help my child. Um, and you hear that a lot. And so the anger and also their own guilt um, of being a parent and a, and a caregiver and not being able to help their child because they are having trouble accessing um, services in the community is incredibly discouraging and defeating. So please don't give up, keep trying, keep calling, call your insurance company and find out who's covered on your plan. That's a good start too. Um, and then talk to your primary care doctor. And, uh, and if, you know, and if you are, you do end up waiting a long time and you're feeling cornered and you just feel depleted there, there are apps available. Um, 
I personally have never used one, so I don't really understand how exactly they work, but um, there is talk space, there is um, lots of um, mindfulness and relaxation apps that are available to kind of do guided mindfulness practices so you can at least um, bring your head and bring your emotions and your and your body into a better place while you wait for a provider to call you back perhaps, um, you know, or you can do um, telemedicine. That is one of the benefits, like Dr. Schwartz said about maybe a silver lining in the field of mental health and during the pandemic is that it does allow a therapist to see more people um, with the ability to see telemed, but um, it's obviously not the same as being able to be seen in person. So, um, but there are apps and there are technologies available. You can do a quick Google search, um, even if you just do top mental health apps um, and just Google it, you'll see a lot of those um, apps come up and you know, read the reviews and see which one fits you. They all work very differently. Okay. Thank you so much to our panelists for uh, their feedback. Uh, now we're, I'm going to turn it over to Nan and uh, she'll uh, take it from here. You know, since 2012, we have seen an increase in adolescent um, depression, anxiety. Uh, interestingly enough, that's when cell phones, uh, smartphones came onto the scene. So many are suggesting there's a connection worldwide. But we know mental health is so important, right? And many of us sort of think of it in terms of suicide, which is sort of the, the extreme. But there's so much, so much in between, right? And we, it really is a part of wellness that we want everyone to think about. We are very fortunate in this community to have some great resources. So while uh, Dr. Schwartz and Cha talked about um, waiting lists and that you may find that, there are also important phone lines you can call where there's someone there 24 hours a day. So Nicole, if you would put in the chat and tell us the hotline number. So people, if it's two o'clock in the morning and they really feel, or they, they have a child they're so concerned about, what's that number, Nicole? Uh, you can reach the contact hotline 24-7 at 315-251-0600. Um, another great number to remember, and i got to make sure I get it right here, is the Crisis Connect number. So people who are um, maybe experiencing a, a mental health emergency or are, are uh, it may be a budding emergency, uh, we have the Crisis Connect number where we can uh, work with folks to de-escalate or make other referrals. That's 251 Zero eight zero zero. So everyone, you will get these resources in an email that's coming from Lisa Mito, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a survey um, that we hope you'll fill out because we, this is for you. We want to provide the kind of information that will be um, current in your life in terms of the things you're dealing with. And you'll also get information on the October 20th session, particularly if you supervise people. Um, we, we want to offer that session to you to think about how you can support people in your workplace and how to create a workplace that uh, really um, encourages people to be healthy and to thrive. So thank you, Lisa Alford, for being our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, Cha, Angel, and also Nicole for being with us. And thank you all for taking time with us today. We hope you have a wonderful day and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.